On this week's episode, we talk to Steve Smith from Mint Property Finance. We talk about growing a sales team, the loan book, his experience in the industry, what Mint is currently offering, and much more. Now, it's time to spend 30 minutes in finance. Hi, I'm Steve Smith, Head of Sales at Mint Property Finance, here talking to David today about all things about Mint, but also all things about the economy and life right now in in the UK property market. Perfect. That was a a brilliant intro. So I appreciate that. Um, And thanks so much for coming on. Obviously, um, you know, we we really like to get to know some other lenders and uh, you've worked at a, a couple of other lenders. Um, are you able to give everybody listening just a, a quick sort of background about where you've been um, and sort of how you got into this industry in the first place? Of course, no problem at all. Um, so, yeah, really, by accident, as I think most people in finance are, you sort of come out of university and sort of I took a graduate scheme at what was then HBOS, so Bank of Scotland back in the day, which became HBOS. I was there for around about a decade, uh, doing all kinds of different banking things, sort of, you know, from retail, doing my CMAP to commercial banking, a bit of invoice finance, asset finance, and eventually sort of found my way to property finance, which I really enjoyed. Um, From then on, I actually became a broker for seven years. uh, And again, dealt mainly in the property market, but also some asset finance. Um, And then since then, really the last sort of, a decade again has been split between um, bridging and development finance in the main for companies like Shawbrook, uh, Glenhawk, Roma, and now Mint Property Finance. Perfect, and it's that is quite a journey. Um, and can we go back to obviously when you left HBOS? What was the sort of was there anything in particular that prompted that move? Especially no, I think I, I just didn't... into the yeah, sort of well, I did ten years. Um, I think it was because I'd done 10 years at the bank. I'd kind of in that 10 years been at many sort of departments and even sort of uh, was a branch manager regionally as well. So I sort of did everything that I had to offer, really. And it was great. It was a really good grounding. Back then, they really did. I mean, they did fully paid my seam out. They put you on very, very good courses, um, how to read accounts and, and very much a good grounding back then of all things finance, which was great. And I really appreciated that. And then I. I don't know. I think for one moment I sort of I thought, you know what, I've been dealing with brokers for a long time. Let's become a broker. And I had this opportunity to become basically um, a sales director at at a brokerage uh, closer to home because I lived in Gloucestershire and it was set there. So I sort of went there and and I did that for seven years again, um, looking at asset finance and property finance and enjoyed my time there completely. It was was very different. It was sort of, you know, it's good to see it from both sides. I think it helps me out with brokers now seeing it from their point of view as well as you know being one for seven years myself yeah we'll get on to that in a bit because that is a it's an interesting step sort of going from broker and obviously we had um alice williams on last week who i believe you know fairly well and she's actually a a question for you um later in in this episode um but it is an interesting step uh going from that way And, and obviously once you decided what was the actual trigger for them moving from a broker back into sort of the lender side of things i think at broker again i had seven years there and i got to the sort of a glass ceiling really at that brokerage um i was sort of running the brokerage but um couldn't get shares in that company because it was a family-owned company and so i sort of hit that ceiling for a while and sort of there's very little for me to to go anywhere else then really within that company um enjoyed the time it was great to do i still have a good relationship with the guy who runs it and it was just i really wanted to go back to um doing sales directly i'd become sort of the commercial director at the end and it was more sort of meetings and board meetings and, and all of those kind of things rather than actually dealing with what i really enjoy doing which is actually following those sales and getting those deals done yeah because that is a um... You know, that's, I guess that is the exciting bit about sort of where the space we're in as well is, is getting the the actual deal in, reviewing it, pushing it all the way through. And if you're not actually on the, the cold face, as it were, um, I can see it getting a little bit sort of not as exciting. Um, and where did you go after brokering then? What was the your next step? So basically, I went to um, Roma briefly. Um to, to go straight there I was there about seven months um and did sort of 
basically their very small auction bridging really back then was, was what they were known for and that's what i did and then i got a call from shawbrook um and again to run the regional office in bristol for the southwest so i went there and then from shawbrook to glenhawk and then from glenhawk to roma uh where i became i was sort of promoted three times the sales director role at roma i was there for four years uh, and recently moved over to mint as the head of sales and I see. It. So you've been in uh, what's that? Four different sort of lenders in our sort of space. Yeah, um, four different lenders within that property sort of bridging and development space. Yeah, which is a that'll be an interesting sort of conversation. And this, you know, before normally we do this at the end, but I, I might as well do it now because it, it actually fits pretty nicely, I think. Um, and as is a, a tradition on the podcast, our previous guest, so Alice Williams from Ultimate. Um, has asked Steve the following. She said, why bridging? What makes you love bridging so much? And how have you found it moving from one lender to another with the change of criteria, et cetera? How have you got your head around the differences? So yeah, what's <laughs> you might've had a, a few minutes to think about this, or you might need a few minutes, but hit me with your, your best shot on that. Okay, David. Well, I think, uh, to be fair, why bridging and development? I love property. I always have done. I mean, certainly going back, I am I am quite old these days. And um, going back sort of 25 years, it was the most interesting part of HBOS when I was there. And I sort of developed a, a real affinity with property full stop. And I, I love sort of going out. I'm very lucky to be able to go out and see with brokers, without brokers, see developers and see these properties being built. And they're so different. Every deal is completely different. Um, and I think it's, it's really important to see sort of, you know, refurb deals, vanilla bridging, ground up developments, commercial, all of that is, is really exciting to me still, um, I have to say. And I, I do love seeing how you look at some plans, some architectural plans, and then see the actual building once it's actually complete. And I still get a buzz for that. And I think so the property finance market is where I am happiest. And it's where I've now been for, you know, well over uh, well over a decade, just doing it completely as property finance. Before that, it was partially for the previous 17 years. So I really do, I get excited by um, the bridge and development space, um, especially in our market, because it is very different. It is very agile. It, it is very, very quick to change. And I like that. I like the ability to be able to be in a company that can do that as well. Um, yeah. As far as getting my head around different sort of product guides and different sort of, you know, terms and conditions and all of that, I suppose because I've done it now uh, via sort of Shawbrook, Roma, Glen Hawk and now Mint, you kind of get your head around it. You know, in a certain way, we're all similar, we're all selling finance. And in certain ways, there's obviously a very much a cultural shift in each of the companies. Um, and I was re I really warmed to Mint's culture because they, they are relationship driven, which is very much my bag. They, they have got a moral compass, which I think is very important. And, you know, I like the fact that we do a lot of repeat customers, repeat brokers. We have those relationships. And I think it's far easier to do business with people you get along with, who understand what you do. And you can get a lot more repeat business that way. Um, and I think I found that with me, which is great. Um, but I think, yeah, I think I get, I suppose your product guide is your product guide. You, you can only really sell what you know. So I sort of get to grips with each product guide wherever I am and sort of, you know, fundamentally bridging hasn't changed that much in the last sort of 20 years. Um, the same rules generally apply. It's just different terms and conditions within those rules. So yeah, I think, I think I, I get to grips with it pretty well. It becomes part and parcel of it, but in general, I think, you're in the same field. So a lot of the brokers are the same. A lot of the customers are the same. A lot of the products are similar. Yeah, because I found it very sort of a bit of a shock when I first moved because I was at Barclays. Um, and then once I moved into, well, it was a peer-to-peer -peer lender that I, I went to. And right. the, the fact that somebody, let's say, had a CCJ, it wasn't the end of the world. That took yeah. uh, some yeah. getting used to. Um, and it, it wasn't an immediate, you know, definite no. Uh, the computer says no. It was a, well, let's let's yeah. understand it a little bit better. And I think that this space obviously is, is great for that sort of thing. And um, now that you're at Mint, are you able to sort of run us over kind of a, a sort of brief overview of what actually Mint's current offerings are? And not necessarily in terms of, 
sort of everything, but the sort of actual business that you're seeing and, and Mint is actually winning? Yeah, okay. I mean, we do uh, your vanilla bridging, your all kinds of refurbs and ground up development, uh, including commercials. We sit in the space of sort of £75,000 loans up to three million. So it's a big space for us. It's like most deals that I see are in that space and have been for the last 20 years, to be fair. Um, deals that we see a lot of at the moment, there's a lot of commercial to resi refurb stuff. And I think anybody listening in our space will probably see that across the board. There's, there's, I think with Brexit, with sort of the change in lifestyle of people buying from Amazon and all of the online stuff, you know, retail is not what it was on the high street. The high streets are changing. We can see that. Uh, and I think when you look at sort of a lot of commercial to resi, you see a lot of, or sort of commercial to semi-commercial even. We see a lot of that. We see a lot of um, first-time developers because we're quite happy with first-time developers. And I suppose that's a little bit of a niche market. So we see a lot of the, the first-time developers coming on board. Um, and because we're sort of more relationship-driven, we do hold their hands a little bit more. Uh, and that probably works for somebody coming into this market because it is quite a big thing to actually, as you say, you know, create and develop a, a new property. And, you know, full yeah. stop. It's yeah. it's really important to do, to, to hold their hands, to make sure they understand everything. And we do that. Um, so we've seen a lot of that. We often do a lot of your auction fast um, bridging as well because we can use AVMs. So it, it solves that that sort of valuation crisis where we've seen a lot of, you know, there's a lack of surveyors in Britain at the moment and things are taking a little bit longer. But by using the AVM model where we can, we can sort of get things done quickly. So we've seen a lot of that as well. So, yeah, so it's a, everything. There's, there's quite a bit of Again, that's one of the really enjoyable things about my job. But I would say probably if you had to press me, the commercial to resi is probably the thing I see more now than I ever did before. Yeah, because that's it. it's an interesting sort of space. And the two things have that you said that I find uh, a lacking in the market is the the sort of smaller development side of things. It is very sort of uh, difficult to fund deals in that sort of space from just chatting with sort of brokers that we work with. Um, and then also the willingness to use the ABM seems to have stuck around for some lenders, but not others. Um, firstly, on the, the development side of things, uh, what sort of... Um, levels and sort of rates are, are currently uh sort of on offer so it, yeah we, we sort of look in the space of, as you say it's sort of levels it's sort of uh, up, up to three million but to be honest that would be more in the within the m25 probably for the rest of of the world which i know very well it's probably more like your two million as a top level point especially for a first time developer for the obvious reasons yeah. rates wise we're looking sort of it's still sub one percent at mint so you're in quite That's a nice good. space there um so you're probably looking at for a ground up development space you sort of 0.9s so you're sort of looking at that that area um, and then sort of on your bridges side, obviously it's cheaper um, because there's obviously not the same risk attached as, as a ground development as there is to a quick flip on a sort of auction purchase for a resi property. Yeah, I think that's very strong still, you know, a really good. Mm, I, yeah, I, it is in the market. And I, you know, I know the market quite well, um, having been around a long time. And uh, yeah, it's, it's still a good offering, I think. Yeah. And rates going up uh, sort of across the board in other places. Not everyone obviously has had to, depending on how they get funded. Um, but yeah, that, I think that's really good. Um, on the ABM side of things, we've recently had a, on a very small residential property, a quote, um, and we're talking sort of 70,000. Um, we went to one of the, the usual panel lenders and the best quote we got was 1,200 and something plus fat, which I think right. is extraordinarily expensive. Uh, for, for something of that sort of level um so that the abms are sort of really sort of useful what sort of levels are you looking at on the the abm side of things sort of so the ABM is, and deal size yeah we do basically up to 65 percent on an avm so it, it doesn't work for everybody so if you do want to get that 75 percent, obviously it gets up that chain so you do have to have a, a physical valuation but if you're sort of looking at 65 percent, absolutely happy to do avms on that level well that's good yeah that, that's i think that's really strong and talking of the the sort of rates and everything um how has the, the sort of base rates actually impacted mint or has it at all 
I mean, it has slightly, but you're sort of protected a little bit in two ways. The first way is with, with bridging development, because it's a monthly rate, not an annual rate, obviously, a sort of 0.25% base rate rise will equate to very little, you know, in the marketplace for our monthly rate. Yeah. Um, and also the, the way we're funded, we do have some funding lines, obviously, as you'd expect for a company of our size, but we also have our own funds and funds from sort of high net worth individuals that support us. So it's not quite the same as sort of, you know, the institutional funding lines. We have quite a nice balance of different ones that we can get funds from. But I suppose so it has affected us. Yes, it has, David, of course, as it has everybody, however they say it. But. Whereas a monthly rate in a resi vanilla bridge might have been 0.75, you know, sort of six months ago, it's probably only 0.8 now. So it's not it's not like it's been massively affected because two things, the funding that we have is is different to your main sort of property, you know, our competitors, if you will. And also, you know, the fact that because it's monthly, it's not quite as affected as a, as a sort of mortgage in the retail market. Yeah, because it is... Um, it, it... It hasn't been too bad um, for some, and it seems to have impacted a few others. Um, I know one particular lender, again, won't name names, that have gone from that sort of 0 0.8 all the way up to about 1.2. Um, so it's, you know, it's a yeah, that significant, is significant isn't it? Uh, yeah. And I think that was purely mm. because their funder has just upped the, uh, the sort of non-utilization fee um, yeah. to X amount. So they, they've got to make up for it um what's yeah your and, of... and i think that is that's a scary place to be if you've just got that one funding line as well um it's it's nice to have the the various funding lines and to have a number of funding lines in different formats so you can you can sort of cushion a lot of these blows really yeah because on your funding lines are they um are they specific for sort of certain products or do you have certain lenders that or certain funders that will cover you across yeah so we've got way? Bit of, bit of a mixed match we've got some institutional funding lines and then as i say we've got our, our sort of high net worths and our own funds that we use so we're not restricted that the institutional funding lines can be used in various ways for all developments or refurbs or or, or sort of vanilla bridging i mean we have a few of them so we can use them each each for each model but also our own high net worths and our own money we can use across the board on anything we choose so it just gives us that flexibility really which gives us our flexibility on rates ltvs the avm model we're not restricted to sort of terms and conditions of a specific bank lender for example yeah as it, it, it i think it works well for a company of your size and uh, do you know off the top of your head how many people actually work at Mint? yeah it's around about 50 it, it, so we're, we're not huge as around about 50 of us at the moment. We are going through some growth. I've been brought in to get a sales team together. So we are growing, but I don't, it, it's not like we're growing to 200 people. It'll probably be we'll be growing to sort of 60, 70 people over the next sort of 12 months. That is pretty big. And what is the sort of loan book size, uh, roughly, if you're, you're able to share that? Yeah, so, so we're basically around about the 120 million mark on the loan book. Um, and again, we're, we're looking to increase that. But again, not necessarily dramatically overnight. You know, I think with all these things, growth that is step by step is the way to go uh, and, and build on, on on the foundations and not sand, really. Yeah, as we say, you know, it's easy to lend the money, uh, but it's it's another thing to get it back. So um, Absolutely. That's... And that's the most important part, of course. Um, exactly. That exit Otherwise... strategy for all bridges is very, very important. <laughs> Exactly. Otherwise, it's just a bit of accounting fun. So um, until it's back in your pocket. Um, what's your actual sort of outlook on the, the sort of bridging space um, and small development, I guess, specialist finance space? How do you see that sort of going? Well, I think I think, you know, we've had some hits. I think people can all understand, you know, the things that we had through Brexit, through COVID, through sort of, you know, labour shortages, cost of materials. We've had all those and it, it has affected us, but not not broken us by any stretch at all. It's we're still a very small country, um, you know, a small island with a big population and not enough houses. So. It, with that sort of backdrop, there's always going to be a need for property developments, um, which is a good place for us to be, really. And there's a lot of money still out there. It's just slightly more expensive. And I think people need to get their heads around that. And I think once they have and we see the economy has 
stabled a little bit and it's stabling even more. We're we're hoping to see, you know, not too many more rate rises across the board. All of us, I think, just just generally. Uh, and we're waiting for it to come down, which, you know, the long term forecast tells us it will. It's just how far we go and when it starts coming down again, I suppose. But yeah. the outlook itself is, is the bridging and development market is just very busy. And I'm sure everybody comes on and tells you this, but genuinely, it's very busy. There's a lot of inquiries out there. There's a lot of people sort of, I think, maybe just getting on with it now because I think, you know, things are slightly better than it was six months, 12 months ago. And I think really for these developers that it's their livelihood, they're going to do it anyway, aren't they? They've seen recessions come and go before. They've seen much worse situations than we have right now. And they're still, you know, developing and, and creating wealth for themselves. So I think it's always going to be. It's a nice space to be in. And I think because we've got a, a large amount of products where we can look at different things, we're not just original, we're not just developments, we're not just refurbs. We can look at a large amount of that, that space that we're in. So it, I still think, I'm, I'm generally, my glass is always half full anyway, as people will tell you, David, but I do feel, um, we're in a good space and it is, albeit there are some issues that you have to look at and we've come through a lot of issues. I still think we're in a, in a strong space in this industry. Yeah, because I've got a, a slightly potentially controversial question, um, but do you think there are too many lenders in this space um, at the moment? Because we see every couple of weeks or you know, at least once a month, a new lender joins, especially the bridging space. Um, what do, you, what do you think about yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting question, uh, and it is a bit of a controversial one, I suppose. I suppose I wouldn't ever say there are too many, because competition is, is good for the, the developers out there, but on the brokers. But I would say for the borrower or the broker, just be aware, ask a few questions of any new entrants to the market, because it is quite easy to get a funding line from a established bank to just do vanilla bridging. But they're just basically, you know, <laughs> lending a, another bank's money. And do they know what they're doing? Have they got experience in it? Have they just got one funding line which could change, which has got restrictions? I think it's always interesting for, and I'm very much a relationship person, so I think it's important to have a relationship with the broker and the funder. So I think, you know, I will be really obvious and clear and honest about where our funding lines come from. And I think people should be. I think so. Do I think there are too many or it's an overcrowded space? There are a lot, but I don't think it's too many. I think for a broker or a developer, just know your funder a little bit more. Yeah, and I think for all the lenders, it's about knowing what actually makes you stand out because, you know, I think Alice said on the last episode that everyone's sort of relatively quick, relatively sort of friendly, um, you know, easy to work with, but they they really shouldn't be USPs. Um, that yeah, should be yeah, a, a sort of... Somebody has, needs a niche, don't they? They need a market where you do have some genuine USPs rather than just we're quick or we're great with people um, yeah. because, you know, you're in business, so you should be both of those. Yeah, because at, at that 1% a month mark, that's where it there is an awful lot of competition. And obviously that's yeah. that's where you really need something. And I think obviously from, you know, our chat and people are able to sort of find out a little bit more um, about that. And where can, if somebody does want to find out a little bit more about Mint, what's the, the best way for them to, um, well, to get a hold of Well, by all means, contact me or, or go on our website. I mean, either's absolutely fine. Um, as I say, f for me, you can, I'm sure they can get access via you david from my sort of um, phone number or email address or you know go onto the mint website and you'll see sort of the standard phone numbers and inquiries email address there as well and it'll have sort of all of our product guides on there so there's plenty of information about us on the website but by all means people can get in touch with me i'm very open david i'll speak to anybody <laughs> perfect and i'll make sure i've got all the um the links and everything below or in the side, depending on where you're listening to this. Um, and what is is next for you then, Steve, in terms of, obviously, you, your job now is to build up the Mint sales team. What does, you said you want to build it, not hugely, but what does that actually look like um, in terms of your sort of end game? And what is your end game just as, as your career? Have you got any sort of plan? Yeah, I, I think 
you know, I, I look at things and I think sort of, I don't really look more than five years ahead. And I think certainly for the next five years, I want to be with Mint. I want to grow Mint to a certain capacity. Um, it's not just about growing numbers of people, of course. It's about getting the right people and the right sort of fit into, you know, your, your genuine culture. Uh, we've got a new BDM, which I won't tell too much. It'd be a little bit of a tease, but I've got a new experience BDM coming on at the end of this month. Um, right. as my first sort of um, superstar and uh, I'll, I'll continue to look for more superstars to actually join the team and to grow it um, so initially it is to grow the team it's to, it's to tell the world a little bit more about Mint because Mint have been doing lots of things really really well but quite quietly um, and I think you know now's the time I am very very loud as a human being and uh, a flag waver so I'll be doing that sort of in the marketplace so you'll probably see me um, out and about uh, in various marketing strategies and sort of on various events just talking uh, about Mint and what we offer the community really. No uh, yeah I think well firstly I wish you the best of luck with it all but how was the the recruiting process going because we had um, Kerry on who's a, a recruiter in this space a um, couple of episodes ago so if you want to listen to that feel free to to look it up. Yeah um, I will do but... yeah. She uh, she was saying that it's it's quite challenging at the moment to sort of match people. There's there's sort of lots and lots of jobs open. Um, how are you finding that actual process of of sort of hiring good quality BDMs? Yeah, I mean, for me, to be honest, um, the the guy that is joining us is is somebody I've known for many years. So for me, I can completely trust this individual and know he's very capable. So it was sort of because I've been around the industry for so long, I know a lot of good people. So it is sort of more my personal network, if you like. Um, but yeah, equally, we're looking, for example, for a sales support person to join us. And, and that's proving more difficult than you would think. Uh, in my head, you'd think that would be you know, a great little role for somebody. It's good to start moving to BDM or do whatever they want to do with it. But it's, as you say, the CV's coming in. There's not a lot of experience out there in this role. And it's because, as you say, it, there's a lot of jobs in our space right now, which is good. You know, that is a, a good place to be. But equally, it's difficult to get people with experience um, unless you, as with the BDM, that's joined us, know them personally. Yeah, because we were the, we had a sort of off the record chat um, afterwards, uh, myself and Kerry, and um, I'm sure she won't mind me saying, but she was saying that some of the salaries are, are quite high for literally straight out of university or even straight out of school level yeah. jobs in this, um, which is is quite hard to balance out. And I don't know if you're um, given sort of set budgets for what you're allowed to spend on the, the new hires. Um, but it seemed to be from sort of our conversation with her, it doesn't always match up with what you're what you're hoping to get with what you're you're willing to pay. Um, yeah, that, that's... I think that's probably right. I think that's probably right across the board, David. I, I think I look at it and I go, well, you kind of I don't have any strict and fast rules or, or sort of you know parameters that I need but obviously you've got to be sensible um you know it's a business and, and you, you know I have certain you know budgets within that business so if I want to get three very expensive people that means I can't get six you know averagely priced people or whatever so you have to sort of do the math yourself and see what business they're going to get for you and work it out but I would say yeah I think in the inflation world that we're in currently you know wages have gone up as well maybe not as much as you know some people would like but certainly in our industry people are not not frightened of saying a, a big salary is a, a starting point of conversation that's for sure yeah because it is you know we we sort of know and talking to sort of people that approach us um it is it's a tough sort of <laughs> tough position to be in especially if you're you're smaller and obviously it's a quite a big upfront commitment for for some of these and you don't know obviously like your new hire if you know them well you know it's going to work out most likely um but otherwise it's, it's quite a big gamble um and in terms of sort of lending side of things moving forward and, and your sort of aims um what sort of level is sort of mint looking to get to um as we again we had acuity on and they were looking to sort of double their loan book but they were they're quite a small lender to start with yeah. um and, and have you got sort of any goal in mind that we can well we won't hold you to accountable <laughs> on here to that no, no, my directors <laughs> might be listening um so so please don't i mean yeah i i have a 
figure in my head uh, and sort of a, a term, but realistically, I want to grow that loan book steadily um, each month. It's that simple for me. It's sort of if we get a bit bigger and a, a bit, you know, across the board every single month, you sort of grow to a certain point. And that way you don't need to suddenly employ lots of people overnight. You don't need to have all that, that training issues. I mean, when there's, when there's 50, in, 50 of you in a company, you can't suddenly become a hundred people in a company, you know, in a year, it just doesn't yeah. work. Um, so you have to do it steadily, but steady growth is good. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, if, if you look over sort of say a, a two year period, um, I probably do want to double the loan book in the next two years. Um, but I think you've got to see how that goes steadily and how the business copes, how the world is, you know, in a year's time, it could all be different again. So you have to sort of have, plans a b c d um to, to sort of cover off what may happen like beyond your control but certainly you know I'll, I'll i'll be honest i'm looking at sort of doubling the loan book within the next two years well that is a yeah that is a a, a serious goal and i i really hope you guys achieve it because what you said about mint sort of earlier is uh, you always hear the name and i'll, I'll be honest about the last sort of 10 years you go oh yeah there's mint um but you, it's not one of the ones like you hear certain lenders that is really loud on LinkedIn, really sort of in your face everywhere you go, they sponsor all the bits and pieces. So it will be good to see, you know, you actually talk, getting out there. And yeah, talk that, about all that is part of my do. job, David, to make sure that people know who wins are. That is definitely over the course of the next 12 months. Uh, we will be more shouting about what we do and, and, and being sort of more in that marketing space and being on those websites, et cetera, to so that people understand what we do do. Because as you say, we've been a little bit of a, a hidden secret. It's been a secret, Jen. I mean, when I joined, absolutely amazing products, good people. This is, you know, where we could grow this reasonably well and reasonably quickly in the industry we're in with these products. Um, so, yeah, it's exciting times. Yeah, because that's that's what I mean. It, it surprises me that it, it isn't shouted about as much. So I'm glad somebody's is uh, you're sort of going to be doing it. Um, and obviously, you know, I don't want to keep you forever. So is there anything else you'd like to sort of let people know uh, about Mint or any, anything at all? No, I don't think so, David. I think you know, I think people just are very open and. And approachable so if people do want to know about mint pick up the phone to me drop me an email have a look at our website um we've got very good products within this industry we've got very good people with very good experience with this industry and i think yeah you, you will see a lot more of us you will see sort of a lot more sort of interviews things like this david to be fair and sort of we're, we'll be at various shows the nacfb for example is wednesday in birmingham we'll be there um yeah. on a stand so again if anybody's going to that and this might go out after uh, yeah, that's it been. will do. But, <laughs> but yeah, hope, yeah. hope but Steve saw there you there. Many then. other networking events, you know, you can have a country like the landlord show in July, we'll be there. So lots of these places will be at. So just don't be a stranger and come over and say hello and find out what we actually do. No, that is brilliant. And that, like I said before, everything will be in the description below. If for any reason you can't find it or anything, just get in touch with me directly and I'll point you in Steve's direction. Um, and hopefully we can get them a little bit more business and help them double that, that loan book. Um, but firstly, thank you ever so much, obviously, for coming on, Steve. Um, really appreciate the insight. And obviously, we could only really just scratch the surface here. There, there's a million more questions I could ask, you know, and I'm not even uh, being uh, hyperbolic about that. <laughs> there's so much that I'd like to know about how you're doing it, just from a sort of a BDM's point of view as well, in terms of what you're your sort of plans are but we'll have to touch on sort of maybe a specific if you want to come back on at some point a, a specific chat about sort of selling and how you sell your products yeah that'd be great support. i mean you know a few months time would be perfect for me to actually you know for people to actually see what I was, I was saying on this one and actually have i done anything have i moved it forward on mint better known <laughs> in a few months time i think that's that's probably uh a, a really good point for me to be and, and sort of like to come and chat to you about something specific whether it's you know uh my sales team has, has been built or at certain products or whatever you would like to really david but it's, it's yeah. been a pleasure it really has yeah. perfect thanks so much then steve really appreciate your time and everyone get in touch with with steve and, and mint and um yeah thanks so much and we'll we'll call it a day there cheers david take care of yourself bye now all right thanks